Token Metrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. We are live. Welcome to the Deluxe Market Update. I'm your host, Bill Noble. This show is brought to you by tokenmetrics.com and cryptostackers.pro. If you need a roadmap in crypto or you just got wrecked, right? Subscribe to this channel or Crypto Stackers. Speaking of Crypto Stackers, I want to introduce right my friend Forrest who's joining us today to give us his expertise Forrest welcome back man thanks for having me back on the stream it's good to be here good to see you good to to be on the the token metric stream like old times it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun right and welcome out there to the stackers nation right welcome to the show so you know obviously if you like the content feel free to drop a like uh and hit that share button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and support Forrest both on his Twitter, right? And on his YouTube, right? Now, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to keep this conversational. We're going to keep it like it's kind of an alpha drop, but it's not the heavy bear market stuff that I've been doing, right? So I'll go through some charts. Forrest will go through some charts. And then we'll have a discussion and we want to bring you the most alpha possible. Now, before we get started, just remember, whoever you've been listening to out there, Forrest is trying to get to a million Twitter followers, right? So help them get there, right? If you need somebody, you need people, real analysts, well, the good news is you're listening to them, all right? Now, with that, I want to jump into your market update. All right, here we go. So, is it relief or is it denial? Right? Is it is it over? Are we done or are we just trying to ignore some stuff that may be out there? All right. Notice I dumped the red shirt for today, all right? I did my sort of like Sell in May and go away. Don't worry, I'm still going to be here, so I'm on the road. But is it relief or is it denial? All right. Obviously, people lost money out there, and if you did, our heart goes out to you. That includes the billionaires who watched, who watched themselves take a 60% haircut. Somebody last night told me that, uh, you know, there was some serious mental health issues, let's say with people who got very, very upset about Luna. Normally when you see these things, you saw them in 1987, uh, that can bring the despair to an end. That said, uh, the biggest hedge fund in crypto is feeling the need to assure its investors by quote, uh, saying that he believes the current digital asset and market conditions warrant providing shareholders and clients with visibility regarding the capital position and liquidity position at the firm. They're like, what does that mean? Well, that means the biggest hedge fund in the world wants to assure everybody that they won't blow up. So if that's what the biggest hedge fund in the world is doing, what are the small ones? What, like, what happened to them? Have they liquidated already? Or is there another wave? We'll check the charts and tell you. Okay, since I'm going to get asked... Right, I'm calling this Luna Inu. Right, I did a stream last night, so apparently there's high demand for TA in Luna. Uh, if you take out all the zeros, uh, eight two two five. I had to resort to a five minute chart. Apparently, this is the new lottery ticket in the market. So if you want to chart it, that's where you are. There may be better things to do with your time and money, but people are involved. Now let's go to the bigger picture. We had support at Bitcoin at 28K. We've been looking at that level basically all year, 
So it held and that's that, right? You know, 28K held until it doesn't, right? There should be at least some pause in this. Now, if you look at resistance, all right, 31.2K shows up as a big DeMarc level. So if, if it really is a bull market or it is an extended correction, you should see the market dip and then take out 31,200. 31,100 comes up on hidden pivot analysis. So if they sort of squeeze all this into the close, you know, you want to see it take out that level. If you don't see it take out that level, then maybe what trading types do is they, the people who bought support at the absolute bottom in the ashes, maybe just taking profits here. It's not a very liquid market because a lot of people got wrecked. So things could, you know, jump around a lot. And these levels are important. Now, in retrospect, I found 1811 as a support level in ETH, and that held. To make a long story short, not only were they after UST and possibly Tether, but there was sort of an attack within the <clears throat> eco in the DeFi ecosystem to try to liquidate, to try to trigger a liquidation of ETH by some big DeFi players. That's the broad stroke, but it looks like that's what drove ETH down and when that attack apparently failed, apparently, okay, that's what brought ETH back. Forrest has got the case for ETH, and you're going to want to stay tuned to hear it. Now, for, uh, for tactical levels, 2048 is support. I have people asking, hey, what's the entry point? So it's not a bull market unless you can buy a dip and make money. So 2048 is possible. 2221 is resistance above the market. So it's not clear. Is this that last rally that we've been talking about on the stream before something bad happens? Or are we done and is Bitcoin going to 35K? Uh, I don't have the crystal ball answers, but me and Forrest will have the levels that you can watch. So you can literally trade it day by day, level by level to see if this thing is going to fail or if there's another leg up. Okay, some good news in ETH with a catch. There's a DeMarc 9 bottom on the ETH daily chart. What's that? Well, Tom DeMarc was one of the first quant TAs, right? Uh, he counts a certain set of conditions, right? When, you know, the set of conditions appears for the ninth time, you pay attention. Then there's another method where you pay attention to the 13th time. Now, with the, nine, with the nine signal, one of two things happens. You get a bottom or a top, and it rotates the other direction, or you go one through nine, you get a counter trend rally that's quite the rip, and then the trend resumes. So beware the failed rally. Okay, ApeCoin. Believe it or not, ApeCoin actually started the bottom. ApeCoin bottom that we had a target of six. I brought it up and just kept right on going. All right. It turns out people really wanted this thing. And the upside target potentially is 10. So if Ape gets to 10 and they don't want it anymore, then that was probably the trade, six to 10. Right. If it goes through 10, this thing has turned into like the new leading indicator. All right. Let's go through some of these destroyed altcoins. So you know, Avalanche had support at 26. They hammered on that for like, you know, like a day, almost a day and a half, right? And it held. So we had Avalanche's support at 26, and we'll talk more levels in a minute. 40 is the level on the upside that if there is another leg to the squeeze, that's where Avalanche would stop, right? Phantom had a target of 26 cents. I don't really know where resistance is. 63 cents is possible, but I'm not sure that's likely given what's happened to total value locked in DeFi. Stay tuned to the end of the PowerPoint to check that out. Okay, near protocol, we had this too. We had a target of five or six. You know, big, big, big venture capitalists, you know, bought near at nine or seven, right? You got to get it at five or six. And the upside target, assuming the rally continues, is eight. 
Now let's, let's talk about our quant driven support and resistance. Like this stuff has been money, right? For, for weeks. So these are levels drawn by token metrics, quant and AI and machine learning. So the quant department runs a program that reads the chart and comes up with levels that perhaps the human eye could see or couldn't, right? So for Bitcoin, it's straightforward, right? 28 was support, 33 is resistance. So if it takes out that 31 level, next stop 33, right? And 24 is a support below the market, you know, if there's a problem over the weekend, all right? Okay, ETH. ETH went all the way down and pulled up a little bit short of 1731. Uh, normally, as you as as token metrics listeners know, I'm not a big fan when it pulls up short of support. Like going back to Bitcoin, I'm real happy to see that they overshot the support at 28 and then came back. That makes me say, all right, this might be stable. Now with ETH, it was so crazy. I'm going to give ETH a temporary pass. But the fact that ETH is above 2029, or if it can stay above that, I believe that's the key to stability. Now, if you look at Ave, oh my God, right? I mean, somebody clearly thought there was going to be an attack of this protocol. You know, I, I had 149 was a level, the market danced around it, and then it went right to support at 82 and held, right? So there's upside here. If people got short this thinking that there was going to be a disaster. Now, if it takes out 82, well, then that would be a warning sign. But a lot of these attacks brought some of these coins to support. And as Forrest will and the Stacker Nation knows, don't sell support, right? All right, Solana, same thing, right? Uh, we had support on this at 40. Uh, the AI now has 34. So I guess if Solana is a mess again, that's where it's going. 66 is possible on the upside if it keeps going. So I'm not terribly excited about the fact that Ethan Solana, right, didn't get to the new points, but, you know, frankly, being negative is exhausting. That's what bear markets can do to you. You can either get complacent, right? That's why I'm saying, is it relief, right? Are you like, oh, you know, thank God we've stopped this. Or is it denial about what can continue to happen? Right now, I would say don't sell support, right, until the market proves that it's no good, right? Avalanche, same thing, right? Throttles through 33 and comes back. You would have to worry if it failed and went back below 33. Near went all the way down this to five, going through the support at 637, right? And now it remains to be seen whether or not these 15 or 20% rally in these coins are going to actually hold, right? Sometimes when a market comes off, if it's making a bottom, it makes you really scared to be long, all right? So if it's a bottom, if this has stopped, don't be surprised if it's scary. Now, again, with near, if it breaks down, I didn't put it on the chart, but just so you know, if it breaks 637, there's nobody home to 3.6. And if near is down there, where's the rest of the market? So I'm not really going there right now, but you need to be ready because you come in on Monday. All right. You come in Monday and you're like, okay, where is this thing? Okay. Phantom, you know, just annihilated, supported 23 cents, probably isn't any good unless it can get above 40 cents and stay there. Okay. Cardano. So I told the Cardano nation that if it broke 84 cents, it would go to 39 that was painful to say, probably more painful to listen to, and even more painful if you owned it. The good news is it held at 39 and a half cents. So at, at least you don't have to worry about selling support. You wouldn't sell support. You'd either buy support for a trade or you would wait. Okay, XRP. This is a lot of pain here. This was a regulatory bet. This was a bet that people were going to be pro crypto, right? And now I'm, I'm somewhat concerned XRP could become the poster boy and the first shot for everybody to come down on crypto, right? Now, XRP is probably better than stable coins in theory, but they're supported 36 cents. 
It paid you to buy it here last time, all right? But it's got to get back above 47 cents before you can say XRP is okay. So I think the legal and regulatory risk has gone up, even though support held, okay? Zcash, Zcash, this chart tells you two things. One, it didn't pay in retrospect to buy any of the winners. So once something went up, if the Stacker Nation had a resistance level, see it, right? And it didn't pay to buy the dip, right? You can buy the small dips in an uptrend, but once something came back 62% or more, done, okay? As uh, Zcash came to 87.78, the privacy narrative uh, was awesome. We'll see if it, it stays awesome. If the, you know, if Gary and Janet, as it says on crypto Twitter, uh, put the evil eye on the whole space. All right. I think the way to follow the regulatory angle is to watch privacy and XRP. Monero, the levels are 167 on top, 141 on the bottom. Again, I know it's kind of a chart bomb, but you want to watch these coins. The, this is the regulatory pulse. Okay, Lido Dow, which may or may not have been a player in this, oh my God, that occurred in the DeFi space regarding, you know, ETH and a related version of ETH that you could stake and leverage yield farm. The good news is LDO hit support at 121 and held. Okay, so the worst for certain cryptos may be over. We'll get into it later or maybe not get into it too much, but okay, maybe the crypto avalanche is over for now, but somebody owned all this crypto. Somebody owned everything and it went down by two thirds or more and that may have implications now or in the future. Okay, Matic, we, we talked about 62 cents. I looked at it. I was like, wow, if it breaks 95, it's going to go all the way down to 62. Now, some word from legacy. Okay. The blue line, the yellow line is what the 10 year note yield thinks about inflation. So the 10 year note worry, worry, worry. Okay. I need more compensation for inflation. And then that rolled over. What I'm trying to tell you is interest rates may have topped right now. If everything is okay and stocks and crypto go up, that could change. But I suspect the bond market has like done its trade. There may be fear in stocks. There may be something to worry about out there. That could be why people are buying bonds. But it could help crypto because interest rates could stop hurting crypto. Now, Coinbase's stock, okay, a lot of serious drama here, right? We have what's called an island bottom. That means there was a gap down and a selling climax. And then when they were done with that, right, it gapped up and moved in the other direction. Now, in my long years of experience, island bottoms work great in commodities and they almost never work in stocks. So the gap up may wind up getting filled in Coinbase. So that means there could be like a retest. And you know what? If you look at the history of crashes, particularly 87, right? It hit support, it came up, and then it took a couple of months, but two months later, it went back to the lows. A lot of people don't remember that about 87. It was actually a double bottom. And don't be surprised after I showed you all those support points, make sure you watch this video and take notes because a retest of support is A, theoretically possible, and B, would not necessarily be, be cataclysmically bearish right? Scary, yes, but if support holds, it holds, right? But when I saw this, I was like, oh my God, you know, they may try to wash it out one more time. Micro strategy, again, gaps, right? It gapped down from 301, pulled up short of support at 77, which scares me. And then it's gapping up today, okay? Not a big fan of micro strategy, and in technical analysis, things happen in threes, right? There was Kathy Wood from ARK, A-R-K-K, -K, 
right? The altcoins of the stock market that went all the way back down to their March 2020 lows. Then, of course, there was Luna, right? The head of Luna was, you know, on uh, some interviews before the blow up, talking about how fun it can be to watch companies blow up that, you know, 95% of coins don't make it. And there was even a Twitter post I saw where he was making fun of the rest of the world for being poor. So when, you know, the hubris of the, of Kathy Wood and ARC and the head of the Luna Foundation gets purged, Michael Saylor may be next. Even though we like him in crypto, you have to be careful because things do happen in threes and there's going to be a third shoe. Now, speaking of ARC, again, the altcoins at a stock market went from 32 to 150 and back to 38. Now I picked, I picked November of 2020 just as a measuring stick for ARC. Now, why am I looking at this? Well, because I want to compare ARC to all the other instruments that are out there, right? So right now, ARC, as you can see in the top line in the spreadsheet, I'm comparing where it was in November of 2020 compared to where it was before I did this PowerPoint, right? So ARC is currently 52% below where it was in November of 2020. Okay, Bitcoin is 100% above where it was back then. And, you know, that may make sense because Bitcoin is the future of money, right? It may or may not be good collateral, but, you know, there's an obvious case for Bitcoin. So, it, But it is 100% above where it is. And MicroStrategy, which owns a ton of Bitcoin levered, is right back where it was in November 2020. It's only 2% above the lows in November. So either Bitcoin has to come down or MicroStrategy has to go up, and I'll just leave that with you. Now let's talk Web 2 versus Web 3, right? Uh, ETH, right, was at 445 in November 2020. It's obviously way above that now. It's 350% above those lows. And since ETH is Web3, that might make sense. But QQQ, which is Web2, is basically back where it was in November 2020. All right. So a stock of somebody who owns a lot of Bitcoin is doing much better than Bitcoin. And Web2 has erased a lot of gains. And Web3 is 300% above where it was back when. So somebody is wrong here. Either QQQ's got to go up, which would be awesome for crypto, right? Speaking of that, so Web2 has that DeMarc 13 signal. Uh, Forrest uses easy bands. I have something that I, I came up with on the DeMarc software, right? That helps us with, you know, dramatic moves, right? So there's a bottom in QQQ, right? is a 13 bottom. So there's some hope for Web2. Now, that said, uh, you got to be careful if Bitcoin can't get through 31,300, right? If it does, great, but there's a lot of room to go down if it doesn't. Total value locked has fallen out of bed in DeFi. So from a sentiment point of view, we were at max fear. DeFi is dead. No one will ever touch stable coins again. Crypto is, is over and that's it, right? It's like pack your bags and go. So this is scary in total value locked, but is it also a sentiment indicator, right? We will find out, right? At 250 billion, it was amazing. And at 114 billion, I'll never touch it again. All right, final reminder, uh, ETH, I, this was on my show. It has a monthly top, right? A monthly 13 top from April. So there is a technical case for ETH to not do so good. Forrest has got a good argument that if ETH holds, then maybe this signal won't mean as much. Okay. This does keep me up at night. Here's another shot that is positive crypto, right? This is that 10-year break even, that inflation metric. It's the worry meter in the bond market. It's falling out of bed. It could crash. So if the bond market isn't afraid of inflation, 
that could help crypto. Assuming the reason the bond market isn't afraid of inflation is because there's some blow up out there that we don't know about. But, you know, it's Friday. Forrest is here. I'm going with the blue shirt. That's why we got the blue graph. Maybe this is the chill out meter. Maybe, right? I would like to think so. Now, stocks, it would be great if stocks went green for the week. If not, it's going to be the sixth consecutive down week. And stocks have to hold up next week for crypto to go up, right? That's just the theme. If stocks start going down, that's going to hurt crypto. I know this is laughable, but in crypto, we're cheering for equities next week. And that is the market update. All right, Forrest, man, over to you. Thanks, Bill. Epic market update as usual. Mehdi, it's good to see you. Um, I will, uh, I'll jump into my stuff and then uh, I don't know if Mehdi's got anything to go over it as well. Maybe we have a little, a little discussion afterwards. But uh, I mean, first of all, before I share my screen here, guys, it's a tough time in the market. It is a tough time in the market. And as Bill was talking about, the biggest players in the market are burned too. That's part of being, if you identify as a crypto investor, you dip your toes into the, the, the fountain of crypto, you're, you're going to get burned from time to time. Uh, that's part of, of being in a very volatile market. It's, it's subject to large, massive downswings and washouts. But the good news is, number one, uh, you're not alone. A lot of people have been burned. A lot of people are down. Number two, you can build back. You can build back. It's going to take some work. Uh, it's going to take good decisions. The only thing that matters right now is your next investment decision. Please, 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 not financial advice, but please do not revenge trade with your entire portfolio. If you find yourself flipping between 100% stable coins and 100% crypto, that, that's a recipe for loss. That's a recipe for disaster. We want to make those calculated good risk decisions. Thirdly, and the most importantly, uh, you're, as a person, are, and I hate to hear the bad news about people that really got burned in Terra Luna making um, you know, bad, bad decisions afterwards, but just know that most importantly, you're worth so much more than the number in your bank account or your crypto portfolio. Um, so just, just know that you're, you're worth, you're, you're valuable as a person. And, and at the end of the day, as much as we love crypto, as, lo as much as we love the market, uh, it is not the most important thing in the world. All right, let's just jump in here. I'm going to share my screen and uh, we're, we're going to start with the fun chart. We're going to start with the fun chart, lighten the mood up a little bit. S&P 500. Guys, you don't have to be a political analyst or even super cynical or even a, a conspiracy theorist to understand that regardless of who's in power, regardless of which power uh, or which party is in power, the current administration has incentive moving into the midterm elections to see the stock market do well, to see the legacy market do well. And we see that reflect, and they do have some influence over it. Now we could be in you know, too big a trouble with, the, with legacy and the financial system uh, for them to do much about it, but they may try to put a Band-Aid on it moving into the 2022 midterm elections. Would not surprise me one bit. In fact, if we go back in time, you constantly see really, you know, uncertain times, volatility, followed by very clear rallies into midterms, right? We can even get that uncertainty backing right up to midterms, but midterm elections come around and you're usually printing all-time highs for the S&P 500 around the midterm elections, right? And we see this over and over and over again. And this is actually back in 2010, uh, after the 2008, 2009 financial collapse and recession, we started rallying out of a crash and then I took this fractal, right? And I, I just kind of superimposed it underneath where we currently are. And situation is very different from an interest rate perspective. Uh, there's a lot of different variables at play, but it's actually very similar from a chart perspective. We're rallying out of a crash. Uh, wouldn't necessarily call it a recession because it's just a crash from the 2020 pandemic. But since then we've been following uh, this fractal very closely. So I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. And you can see just how closely we've been following the exact pattern that we made back in 20, 2010. Now, we've also started to see a, the S&P 500 start to rally here like we would expect it to if this happens, right? If this 
fractal holds true. Uh, now, fractal analysis is very iffy. It's it's spotty. A lot of times you'll you'll get 90% of the way through a fractal and eventually it's got to stop following. It's not going to follow it perfect every single time. But this can give us a little bit of hope that maybe the bottom for the S&P 500 could be in. Maybe we could be creating a local bottom. Maybe we won't follow this perfectly. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll at least see a bit of relief. Regardless, it's fun to keep track of, especially when it's moving this closely. And it's definitely something that I'm watching. I want to go over to total crypto market cap because like I mentioned the beginning, uh, the only thing that matters is our next investment decision. And we want to be making sure that we're making sound decisions around our investments. Calculated, uh, good risk to reward ratio investments. This is total cryptocurrency market cap. Uh, it's very, very interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One, because this is a logarithmic scale and we've, and, and you know, I've, I bring up this chart all the time. This is my go-to chart. This is the entire cryptocurrency market cap. It has been following this exponential trajectory, right? We're on a logarithmic scale, but we've got linear growth. So that's exponential growth over a nine year period of time. It has broken on two occasions. We could absolutely get a crash, a capitulation below this. But when we're on this line, that is simultaneously has been the worst time to sell your crypto and the best time to buy crypto. And yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. When we're on this trend line, and we're not going to hold this trend line forever. Don't be mistaken. We can't hold a, an exponential growth trend forever. Eventually, it will be gro broken and we'll go, you know, maybe more logarithmic. But we're on that trend line right now. So it is objectively, it is objectively less risky to buy crypto now, right, when we're on this trend line support than it was to buy crypto up here, right? The beautiful thing about a crash the beautiful thing about a crash is that you don't have to worry that you're buying the top, right? Now, if we kind of zoom back or, or zoom out and, and kind of move back over, over here at, at you know, 1.6 trillion in total cryptocurrency market cap when Bitcoin was 50 or $60,000, you kind of, you, if you're buying here in the back of your head, it's like, geez, I, I, Bitcoin, you know, they say it's going to 100K, but I sure, I sure hope Sure hope I'm not buying the top. Well, the beautiful thing about a crash is you know with 100% certainty you are not buying the top. You're not buying the top. The top was up here, right? We know that now. Now we're 50 plus percent off of the top and it's considerably a much lower risk time to buy crypto. Not only that, we have two big catalysts coming up and these are catalysts in the two largest cryptocurrencies by market cap. Uh, objectively the lowest risk cryptocurrencies to be invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, based on past performance and, and a number of other analysis points we could get into. But the next big catalyst in crypto is the Ethereum merge. And that is slated. There's no specific date yet, but that is slated to happen somewhere between Q2 and Q3, or I'm sorry, Q3 and Q4 of this year. I believe that once we get a, a specific date announced, we're going to see a lot of rallying in Ethereum. In fact, smart money, uh, according to Nansen AI, has accumulated nearly $500 million of ETH, staked ETH, wrapped ETH, or any sort of ETH derivative you can think of in the last seven days. Smart money wallets are buying so much Ethereum right here. It's not even funny. In fact, if I was selling, if I had sold, and if you're selling your Ethereum down here and the smart money wallets are sucking it up like a vacuum, I would be concerned about selling my Ethereum. Now, here's the thing. Yes, we're in the middle of a scary crash. If we go over to the Ethereum chart, right? And I'll actually go over in Crypto Stackers Pro real quick so we can throw on the easy bands, right? If, if we look at the Ethereum chart, we, we understand that we can go lower. We, we can absolutely go lower for Ethereum. In fact, we, we did see the 1790 1x short level hold support. So that could be a solid level that we could be bottoming at. We do have a local high up here that we can use our short levels to, and that would give us support around $1,483, which is in line with our green easy band level. We can, and I wouldn't be surprised if we do put in one more bottom. 
at around fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars for Ethereum, maybe twenty four thousand for for Bitcoin, uh, as Bill had on the token metrics indicators. I've got twenty four k as well for a, a big support level using the crypto stackers indicators. We've got confluence of support across multiple indicators that twenty four k and fourteen hundred dollars for Ethereum could be big support. If that happens and you bought Ethereum at eighteen hundred dollars or even two thousand dollars it's really not that big of a deal in my opinion. We want to zoom out and look at the, the big picture. Yes, Ethereum can drop to, to $1,400, but we believe in it and we're investing for the long term. So, so what if we bought this initial bounce off the green easy band back in 2018, we peaked at $1,400 and we dropped to $368. You're so much better and you have so much less risk and less downside if you're buying when it's oversold at $384, instead of buying up here, buying the top at $1,400. Yes, we did get a long bear market. And I actually do not believe that we're gonna get a, as nearly long of a bear market this time around. I think the bear market will be much shorter for multiple reasons, including the fact that the Ethereum merge is very close on the horizon, right? But your downside from buying an oversold market crash is so much lower. And a lot of times these market crashes are the year-long bottom, right? The, this, like if you bought the next huge crash or capitulation below the green easy band, you're buying oftentimes the bottom, right? Back in March of 2020, we got the pandemic crash. If you're buying the green easy bands here, the capitulation, the oversold nature of the market, the crash, you're buying the bottom, right? So we know that objectively it's less risky right now. We've got to flip the switch in our heads. It seems like it's extremely risky to buy right now because everything's capitulating. There's FUD in the air, everybody's selling off. One of the biggest cryptocurrencies just went to zero, Terra Luna, right? Or Luna Inu is I, I like how Bill calls it now. Um, we know that it's objectively less risky. We have to, we've gotta, we've gotta be smart here. We've gotta make the next smartest investment decision for ourselves, right? So on the fact of the ETH merge or on the topic of the ETH merge and kind of what I'll leave it, uh, leave it at uh, for Ethereum, We'll briefly take a peek at Bitcoin's levels. But the Ethereum merge is, is doing something really, really interesting. A lot of people are talking about the net issuance of Ethereum going down, which it already has actually dropped. We've got a net reduction. If we look at watch the burn, this is just EIP-1559 burns a portion of Ethereum fees, right? And we've seen re uh, a net reduction, a net issuance reduction since August of last year of about 55% for Ethereum. Now when the Ethereum merge comes around, and we move from proof of work to proof of stake, right? This is, this is the Ethereum's upgrade path. We're moving from proof of work to proof of stake. The net issuance is going to be dropping again, and it's gonna go from about 2% inflation per year to probably about negative one, maybe negative 2%, depending on uh, how much transaction activity there is on, on the Ethereum blockchain. But what people aren't talking about, and, and to be fair, that reduction in issuance, I believe is gonna be huge. It's what sparked the, the Bitcoin, uh, or what, what sparked the entire bull market with Bitcoin. When, Bitcoin's, when, when Bitcoin halves, uh, this last halving, it was around, if we go to Bitcoin, it was around a 3.8% inflation rate or issuance rate, getting cut to about a 1.9% inflation rate, right? Uh, Ethereum's about to go from about 2% to about negative 1%. So that's going to have a massive impact. But what a lot of people are failing to understand is that there's a certain amount of overhead in the Ethereum market that is being removed, right? So understand this. When miners validate transactions on the Ethereum blockchain, they have to pay or they have overhead in the form of electricity, equipment, and a lot of times space that they rent, right? So they've got to sell the Ethereum rewards that they're earning to cover that to cover that overhead. Now imagine if Amazon, all of a sudden you could wave a magic wand and Amazon could get rid of all of their overhead on their business. And you knew that they were gonna be able to, to get rid of all of that overhead for their business ahead of time. And they're in the middle of a stock crash. Well, would you buy Amazon stock? Yeah, I would because I would expect them to be wildly more profitable and I would expect their stock price to reflect that. So we're in a situation where we're no longer going to see those miners getting rid or selling, ca causing constant sell pressure on the Ethereum market uh, to cover their overhead, right? And we're getting this crash before the merge happens, 
right? So I would expect Ethereum to appreciate rapidly in price. So yes, we are in a very volatile time period and Ethereum could drop further. We've got support around $1,400, $1,500, right? So buying it at $2,000 doesn't feel great. But if it drops to fourteen dollars to $1,500, I've got capital on the way. I'm, I'm getting in very, very aggressively. And even if it doesn't drop in the bottoms in, I'm going to be continuing to accumulate until we reach that, that merge period of time where we should expect to see some price appreciation for Ethereum. Lastly, I do want to just take a look at the Bitcoin chart, give you guys the easy band levels and the margin pressure levels that I'm paying attention to, as well as the uh, risk reward levels. So the easy bands here, historically the best time to buy Bitcoin is when it's oversold in this green band. Right now we are oversold towards the top of that green band. However, we know that historically, especially in the bear market, we can go back down to touch the bold green band, right? We are not quite there yet. That would be $20,000, which would be in line with our previous all-time high. And we are tilted down a little bit. So if we have another leg down, expect 20 to $24,000. Why $24,000? Well, if we throw on our margin pressure levels from our last local high, first I'll actually throw it on from our all-time high. You can see the support that we get around this 1x short level and we bounce up and get a relief rally up to the 2x short before coming back down and touching it. This is the point at which you can no longer short Bitcoin on leverage and hide your liquidation point against the all-time high or above the all-time high, right? It's very, very important because what you see is a lot of short pressure leaving the market when we get there. Right, if we move this to our last local high, the place where all the leverage shorters want to hide their liquidation points, right, you're going to see that they run out of short pressure. They run out of the, they, they can no longer safely short Bitcoin as soon as it drops to around $24,000. So that's why for me, $24,000 is a big support level. I, I know uh, Bill and team have it as a big support level as well. So that's what I'm looking out for. Uh, the last level I'll show you, this is called a sunset line. This is showing where the risk to reward incentives shift in the market, right? And if we just assume that the, the bad scenario or the risk scenario for Bitcoin is roughly zero, it's going to zero, and the reward scenario is that it goes back up to test its all-time high, you start getting a two-to-one risk-to-reward ratio on buying Bitcoin at around $23,000, right? 23.5K, right? And we could adjust these levels a little bit and you see that uh, some of them show up around 24K as well. So 23 to 24K, very strong support, 20K, super strong support. Uh, so no, we could have another leg, leg down, but to me, that is a massive buying opportunity if we do, especially with the, the merge coming up and especially with uh, we're the, the best time to buy Bitcoin is two years, you know, within that two year window before it's, it's next having that next having is May, t uh, March of 2024, March or May of 2024, which is coming up soon. It's actually March. Uh, so yeah, I mean, bear market is where you build bear markets, uh, where you make your money. And with that, I'll kick it back over to Bill and Medi. All right. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you, Forrest. We, we really appreciate you bringing your perspective, particularly all that work on ETH, right? We understand that there was you know, kind of uh, a hiccup in the ETH ecosystem. Uh, Mehdi, how you doing? I wanted to introduce Mehdi, right? He's our director of research. He oversees all the fundamental DeFi and NFT analysts. Uh, Mehdi, welcome to the show. Uh oh, we don't hear your audio. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Welcome, Mehdi. Uh, yeah, so I'm also very bullish ETH. Uh, if you, uh, I'll share my screen later and show you the TM platform. It has one of the highest technology grade and 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 fundamental grade we ever ever had in our history in terms of uh, in terms of a cryptocurrency. Even though the short term indicators are not that bullish, long term um, there are few catalysts after the ETH merger, as 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 Forrest alluded earlier, will be very bullish for ETH. So let me just paint a picture. So right now, ETH is proof of work. And then after proof of work, it will transition towards proof of stake. So the first thing that will happen is miners are not going to sell. So at the moment, there's a selling pressure coming from miners who mine Ethereum to secure the network. And when they secure the network, uh, they, they, they earn ETH and they sell it in the market. In proof of stake, that won't be the case. And secondly, in proof of stake system, ETH will also become deflationary. 
so all the fees that will be generated by the network, partial fees will be burned. So that will be a deflationary pressure. And third, it will be good for the environment. So there is an ESG trend that will make uh, make a lot of institutional interest go higher. So after ETH, uh, I, I feel there will be a lot more buy pressure, a mo lot more demand, restriction in supply. So price should go higher. Speaking in a uh, speaking at least from a theoretical standpoint, also one comfort level for a lot of uh, people would be that after ETH merger, a lot of people can stake their Ethereum. At the moment, there is risk. If I stake my Ethereum, if the ETH 2.0 doesn't go through, my Ethereum is locked. My Ethereum is locked. So when Ethereum 2.0 happens, people can stake and unstake as they will. So there is uh, there there is this play of Ethereum, and and that makes me very bullish long term. But let me quickly share my screen and just show you guys uh, some so some of the technology, uh, uh, some of the indicators from our from our platform. Uh, can you guys see my screen? So at the moment, short term, uh, given the condition of the market and also also based on some of the quantitative metrics, Ethereum in, in monthly to weekly standpoint, there, there isn't good news there. But when you look for long term uh, fundamental catalyst and the technology, ooh, like it scored 88 percent and 96 percent. So I think in technology, in, in terms of technology, in terms of comets committed, uh, there is nothing like Ethereum at the moment, in my opinion. So how, how can you play Ethereum merge? Uh, so there are various ways you can play. It. So we also have a coin department at, at Token Metrics where we just do not just look into traditional instrument, but we also go above and beyond. So one of the interesting play was to buy Ethereum uh, call spreads December 4th quarter of 2021 at a higher strike price. Let's say 3,000, 4,000. So if so you can buy those strike price depending on the implied volatility between $10 to $20, but the upside could be huge. So that's one way to play it. The other play, uh, the other way to play it would be, which is slightly riskier, but could, could also be very fruitful is via Lido DAO. Lido DAO is also another project that scored highly on our fundamental. So Lido DAO allows uh, you to accrue value through staking service. They take 10% commission and they also have 30% uh, or like 30% of circulating supply of Ethereum within within their control. And it's not just a play on Ethereum. It's also a play on other L1s such as Solana. Solana is also another project I'm, uh, Bill, I'm very bullish on. Uh, I, I don't know if you, if you guys feel the same. Uh, even if you look at the daily indices, I feel Solana on, on daily basis and also long-term basis, it's being picked up. So Lido DAO, uh, like... Lido staked ETH because it, it's trading at like 3-4% discount and Solana are also being picked up by our algorithm in terms of good short-term trade as well as long-term investments. Uh, so Solana, the reason why I like it um, is if you look at the development happening, Jesus, like like you have step in a killer Web3 app happened on Solana. Uh, there is another uh, application called Hive Mapper, which is like a helium, but for but for Google, like it's a, it's a helium type play and they're trying to make a decentralized Google Maps, so which is which is very interesting. And thirdly, there are also other interesting games that are building on. So I recently in the private market saw Biomes, which is a decentralized Minecraft with a lot of different cool applications of NFT, also building on Solana. So seeing a lot of innovation on Solana and also our algo is recommending Solana. And I also feel if you guys are wanting to build a portfolio, like a barbell portfolio where you're hedged either side, I feel Ethereum 2.0 will become sharded, will have rollups. There is slight concern on the com composability side and Solana on the direct opposite end, uh, not as decentralized, not as secure, but the most scalable and the most composable, having both of these uh, killer L1s in your, in, in your portfolio will hedge you e either way. And if both survive, if, if it's like a winner take all market similar to D5 we have seen, these two coins can really outshine and, and take a lot of capture of some of the uh, some of the coins, some of the layer ones that have died. So, for example, Luna is no longer there. There is this market share gap that needs to be captured. So Solana, some of the other layer ones will will try to capture that. And they also have a stable coin called UXD, which is a very innovative way 
uh, also playing algorithmic plus collateralized stablecoin. So a lot of things happening. Um, I look into this. I look into the crypto horizon from three to five years time. Uh, I remain bullish, even though the short term there will be volatility. Uh, there could be a lot of hurt. But when you see some of the projects, like this is one of the reports we did. Uh, there's projects like Celestia XLR that have also scored very highly uh, by our analysts. Uh, I, I think the future is very bright. So XLR is one of the projects that will allow blockchains to communicate between each other. Celestia it will allow, it has a similar architecture as Ethereum that allows different types of virtual machine, different types of blockchain to become a layer two on top of it. Again, a very interesting application. So all of these things just excites me about the space. And I feel if we do enter a bear market, this will be the best time and best opportunity for you guys to invest in yourself and your education and, and, and just learn about the space and try to build up a position. So when we get out of the bear market, uh, you guys are happier, more intelligent and wealthier. All right. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, appreciate that tour of the token metrics world, both the site and the human driven research. Uh, one final note I'm going to share on that. Uh, this is called an insurance policy. Uh, let's see if I can get to it. All right. I can't quite share my screen right this second. But what I can tell you is that token metrics has what's called a, you know, it has a, a token metrics grade, right? And then I refer to it as the close encounters of the third kind formation. So let me try the screen share one more time. <clears throat> At token metrics, when the grade goes to 80, okay, that's generally a good sign for the coin. Now, when a grade goes above 80 and then falls out of bed, okay, that's the time to get out. And it's not only time to get out, but it's time to stay out. So let me try the screen share one more time. Okay. So the yellow line is the token metrics grading system. So when Luna was at 43, our grade shot up from 23 all the way up to 88. Now that coincided with Luna going to 67. And as you can see this yellow line, our grade stayed up. So it was grade up, stayed up as Luna Moon to 100. Then as Luna sort of lost momentum, the grade fell out of bed, right? fell out of bed, the grade went from 76 to 25, right? So once the grade collapsed, right, that was the time to absolutely exit Luna. Exit, like go and don't come back, right? And here is our visual trends indicator, right? So on our visual trends indicator, not sure if you can see this fully or not, but there was a negative signal in April, okay? And then the computer, right, didn't flip. So this is different than the grade. It uses momentum, right? So the smart money knew there was something wrong with Luna. Why? Because when it rallied, right, the computer didn't switch to green. It didn't believe in the uptrend. So on one hand, the grades got you out, right? And the momentum indicator is like, stay away. So at Token Metrics, we have a YouTube channel. We would love it if you would subscribe to it. We have a website and a platform that helps you identify what the next good coins are. We have a spreadsheet where we track how the AI grade moves. Somebody asked me the other day, this is a really interesting question. They said, you know, if the market goes to pieces, what coins are going to be out there that are big five years from now? Now, it might be Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and Avalanche, but it may be something that hasn't even been around or been seen much. Or maybe it's now, it's a micro cap. And we can actually help you capture that, right? As in addition 
to providing you insurance, both from a technology and a human analyst point of view. All right. So with that said, let's play just a brief silly game. So before, you know, before we came on the air, somebody commented that, you know, they should get me a dark suit and I should be fed chairman. Okay. That's, uh, that's pretty funny. So if I was fed chairman, dot, 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 right. Uh, I think this is what I would do. I would do a version of, you know, instead of selling May and go away, I would do, you know, kind of like smash it all and go away. Right. I would just step up to the podium and say, hi, everyone. Inflation is out of control. Stop. All right. We're going to raise the funds rate 200 basis points to leave the federal funds rate at two and a half percent. Right. And then we're going to see how that all plays out. Uh, you know, I got plane tickets here. I'm going to go on vacation and we'll see you just after the election to see how it's going. And then I would let, you know, stocks, AKA monkey market, all figure out how to adjust themselves given that I would make the big move and let them go. Now, <clears throat> that's how I would do it. So if that's what, you know, now that may or may not be crypto friendly. I personally think it might be market friendly because it would end the constant uncertainty. So I don't know if you gentlemen have a, uh, you know, if you want to play, if I was Fred chairman, I would, or you want to move to a different discussion, maybe about what was going on in that Ave ecosystem. So if you want to play Fed chairman, go right ahead. Yeah, I mean, I hate to, to be controversial, but if I was Fed chairman, I'd really, really hope that I could uh, reduce the amount of money that is printed that doesn't go directly to uh, to help the people uh, of this this fine country. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd really want to slow down the money money printing for 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 some stuff that uh, we may not. Should, should probably not be printing money for, uh, especially billions and trillions uh, of, of dollars. So yeah, we really want to dial back the, the money printing uh, for the long term. Obviously, when they print money, right, stocks go up and that's great. Crypto goes up, license to speculate. Uh, but in the long term, we get pinched in these big bubble bursts and crashes. And, and it would just be nice if we could dial back the, the reckless printing. All right. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a Pinterest approach to this question. If I was Fed chairman, I would actually print money and buy Ethereum and <laughs> also try to bail out, uh, if I had the opportunity, uh, bail out UST. Uh, I, I felt um, after this whole debacle, I, I think crypto is now one year, two year behind. I was really vouching for a decentralized stablecoin because in the end, if we had a decentralized stablecoin, all the influences of Fed whether it's money printing, whether it's inflation, whatever is happening in traditional real economy would have been bifurcated and we would have been isolated from those shocks in, in the digital economy. So it's, it's a real sad day for crypto. I think we are set back one year, two year. And I think there will be new experiments done to kind of make a new decentralized stable coin in whatever capacity, whether it's collateralized, whether it's algorithmic. But I was really vouching for UST to, to, to become one. Uh, so yeah, if I was Fed chairman, bail out UST and also buy Ethereum. Uh, yeah, because yeah. Uh, can you imagine if some like big macro hedge fund came in and either bailed out UST or somehow absorbed all that blockchain technology and made it better? That leaves me with like a final note. So obviously, we got people out there that lost money and got hurt. I understand that that's painful. But one thing you have to be proud of as a crypto investor is that you participate in a free market, right? It's not necessarily propped up by the Fed, although we all are experiencing the pain of not being backstopped by the Fed, right? But in free markets, things blow up. Like, for example, do you remember in 2020 at the start of COVID when oil, oil went to zero? It went to zero, right? It was actually negative. Someone was like, I will pay you to take my oil, right? In free markets, crazy things can happen. And if, you know, Luna and its stable coin experiment failed, well, you can be rest assured that any other experiments that come out along those lines, right, they'll be stronger. 
So it hurts people and it hurts confidence, right? But there was a lot of despair at the low in 2008. I remember a view, a review of the Batman movie that came out back then. And the concluding line from the Wall Street Journal was that happy days are dead and gone. We will never be happy again, right? And then the S&P went up, you know, 500%. So all is not lost. Beware of the failed rally. Don't feed the bear. Buy support. Sell resistance. And, you know, with my colleague, Mehdi, it pays to do your homework because what's next is never obvious, right? It's never obvious, and you've always got to do your homework. All right, gentlemen, tell everybody where they can reach you on Twitter. Forrest, you first. Yeah, uh, it's up above my head there, at 0xStacker. I've been focusing a lot on providing as much alpha and value to uh, my Twitter audience as possible, putting out daily threads, putting out my thoughts on the market on a regular basis. So check out 0xStacker on Twitter. All right, Mehdi, what about you? Yeah, I, I would urge the audience to just subscribe to Token Metrics Twitter account. I've been uh, all the analysis uh, that goes through on Hidden Gem Reports and Deep Dive. We're making thread formats and, and and putting it out there. So we did a thread, amazing thread format on on cyber brokers and uh, some of the some of the other early stage projects. So if you are looking for alpha, uh, not only subscribe to Token Metrics but follow us on Token Metrics uh, on on our Twitter uh, Twitter handle. So the Twitter handle is at the rate token metrics, uh, INC. Right. Token metrics, Inc on Twitter, tokenmetrics.com. All right. The final word, you never think about your car insurance until something happens to your car. You never think about home insurance until something happens to your home. Think about token metrics as portfolio insurance when the market's going down and the hidden gem finder and trend follower and portfolio organizer on the way up. And you're like, Bill, I just, I made you know, my portfolio just got hurt. You mean you want me to spend money on insurance? And I'm like, yes, spend the money on the insurance because whether this is over today or it's over in November, all right, protect yourself so you don't get wrecked. Okay. So stay with token metrics right? Stay with Forrest and stay with Medi, right? He helps our premium groups, you know, navigate the world of upcoming projects. So folks, that is the deluxe market update. I'm your host, Bill Noble. I will see you all on Monday.